Hey everyone, welcome to this week's episode of Hormonally Speaking. I am really, really excited today to talk about the subject that we're going to cover because it is the number one issue for clients when they come to me. It has definitely been a journey myself in dealing with uh, sleep issues post all of my surgeries years ago and um, probably a little combination of going into perimenopause too. So today's guest is going to illuminate the subject area for us. And so I'm super, super excited to talk to her. And her name is Dr. Leah Saunders. And turning her postpartum sleep deprivation into an opportunity to serve the millions of women who suffer in sleeplessness, Dr. Saunders is a naturopathic doctor and a mom of two who deeply understands the struggle of insomnia. Dr. Leah is an innovative leader and engaging speaker, passionately educating women as well as clinicians on the intersection of sleep and hormone health. Her passion for helping women get a good night's sleep fuels her private practice that helps women gain energy, balance their mood, regulate hormones, and sleep deep. Dr. Leah is the creator of the Better Sleep Bootcamp, the five-step framework for women who want better sleep through hormonal balance. Ultimately, her goal is to help women reclaim their rest so that they can do what sets their soul on fire during the day. With sleep scores that make us all jealous, Leah's ultimate mission is to help women chase their dreams, not exhaustion. Welcome. Thanks so much for having me, Christine. I'm like, I'm on fire from just that last <laughs> paragraph. I was like, let's talk about yeah. it all. So first, I think, you know, I think so many women, um, probably younger now start to deal with sleep issues, but so many of us, we sleep fine for our 20s for the most part, probably our early to mid thirties. And then maybe starting our late thirties, we're starting to have some sleep issues. So can we talk about what's happening mm -hmm. in that time? Absolutely. So we see that there's no real sex difference with males and females until we reach puberty. And then things start to change. And I would say exactly what you notice as well in my clinical practice. Like generally I'm not working with women until they're into their mid to late thirties. And then I, I always say there's like whispers of perimenopause or whispers of sleep disturbances. And, and what I often hear from women is that they'll say like, Oh, every now and then I, I don't sleep well for a couple of nights. I don't know why, but it just happens. And I used to brush that off for myself. And I used to brush that off for my patients too. And once I struggled with my own sleep and insomnia and had to figure out how to fix my own sleep and then really appreciated how many of my patients were suffering and, and that I mm -hmm. quite honestly wasn't doing a good job supporting mm -hmm. them mm -hmm. that I was like, okay, there's something, there's something going on here. What is it? And so through sifting and diving through the research and, and like I said, fixing my own sleep, it really came to understand, okay, we start to see these differences become more profound and more obvious really through reproductive years and a common precipitating factor for so many women for sleep disturbances is of course having kids, right? <laughs> maybe they're real human kids or maybe it's a fur baby, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Pets tend to get the sleep training a little bit faster and sooner, but regardless, when you have something in your life that first interrupts your sleep, that's what we call a precipitating factor. Mm -hmm. And if we're able to bounce back from that and adjust our external environment or regulate our nervous system, or depending on what's happening hormonally, we can manage it and mm -hmm. we can overcome it. But what's happening beneath the scenes or behind the scenes for so many women through their late thirties. And of course, into their forties and beyond are hormonal changes that aren't always, always obvious. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. sleep disturbances, meaning like whether it's falling asleep, that it's taking you longer to fall asleep or you fall asleep fine and struggle with those middle of the night wake-ups, or all of a sudden you're waking up earlier than you want. And for some reason, you just can't sleep past that like 4 35 AM mm -hmm. mark. Mm -hmm. That can be the first symptom of perimenopause, even if your menstrual cycle is still completely regular and you don't notice any other changes. You don't notice hot flashes. Your mood is the same. Of course, maybe your energy is affected, mm -hmm. but we're not told that. Right. Right. We're not Absolutely. told that sleep is probably related to our hormones. We're told, yeah. oh, well you're 40 and you have two kids and you're a working mom and you've got to commute and you're balancing this and your parents are aging and da, 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 da. Like, yeah. of course you're stressed and of course you can't sleep. And of course you're tired. Right. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. We're not given an opportunity to investigate and understand how our hormones might be playing a role. And of course, then what we can do to support that aspect compared to just taking a pill. 
Right, right. And that's honestly what happens majority of the time, right? Is that women get prescribed a pill um, and sort of muddle through because I think sometimes those pills can be helpful for a while and then they're not it's so helpful. And, you know, obviously how it uh, can cause side effects and things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm so glad that you brought that up because so many women really just look to their period as kind of the indicating factor mm-hmm. of I'm in perimenopause. And mm-hmm. there's so many women that don't, you know, because we haven't been taught that mm-hmm. you think that you don't go into perimenopause until age 48 or 49, mm-hmm. you know, and it's mm-hmm. this like little period of time before you mm-hmm. hit menopause at 50. And, you know, like you said, this, the biggest symptoms I see are sleep issues and anxiety issues mm-hmm. as women start to shift. And I think that they're very intimately connected too. Of course. So what is sort of the first line of defense once we do start getting into this stage of our life to help us mm. sleep? Mm-hmm. It's such a great question. So part of it, I think is to really understand your nervous system. And I always like to say that sleep is the ultimate gauge of your nervous system. Mm. And so we can think that we're doing a good job managing our stress. We're keeping the balls in the air, but if we're still struggling with sleep, it's often, I always, I always say like, if the only time you're undistracted is when your head is on the pillow, Mm -hmm. if it's the only time in a 24 hour period where you have a minute, right. right, That's a problem, Yeah, but it's also a reality for so many women who hit the ground running in the morning and are go, go, go always on receptive mode from messages and texts and emails and whatnot coming in. And then always giving so much of their energy out to take care of everyone and everything else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's counterintuitive, but when we have more blank space in our day and are able to connect with ourselves and take a moment to like, yeah, how am I feeling and what's actually happening in my body and what do I need in this moment or today or, or later today that really shifts our nervous system from that fight or flight to that rest and digest mode. But we are telling each other this narrative. So when I was pregnant, it was, well, enjoy your sleep now. Cause you're not going to get it. Once mm. it and you know, mm-hmm. you know, of course your sleep is going to be disrupted, but that's part of it. And then the conversation was like, Oh, you're 40, your sleep sucks now. Oh, or like you're menopausal. You don't sleep anymore. Right. This is, yeah. this is what happens now. And so if we can start to shift those narratives, we can also start to shift the narrative around things like taking a lunch break. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like these are the questions that we need to ask our, ask ourselves, which sometimes seem very simple, but we don't realize the impact that they're having. On us. So one of the things I have women in my program do is a cortisol break and accelerator audit. So Mm -hmm. what are the things that you're doing that are putting the brakes on cortisol? Like, Mm -hmm. are you moving your body every day? Are you able to take a break? Are you able to engage with the people that you love? right? Like be present with your partner or your kids, or do you have a supportive community? Are you able to unwind and unplug at the end of the day? Or is your cortisol always accelerating? Is that that gas pedal down because you're go, 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 you're skipping meals. You're not, you you don't know, or you don't feel comfortable. You feel guilty for taking a break, right? All of these, all of these things compound over time. And it's like, of course, at the end of the day, your body has no idea how to lie still and fall asleep for eight hours. Yeah. And I find many women too can get caught up in this. Okay. I've been giving out all day. And so I want this time at night. It's almost like they push off bedtime because it's like, okay, this is me time. This is Mm -hmm. me getting, getting to veg out or, Mm -hmm. you know, do whatever. And Mm -hmm. then, you know, as we know, we've talked about on the uh, podcast before, you know, our cortisol starts to rise again Mm -hmm. in that sort of 11 Mm o'clock time. And so, so many women are like, well, I feel that's when I feel energized. And it's like, yeah, of course you feel energized because your cortisol is going up when, you know, when we need things to be calming down. And so, um, I, I see that as another component of if you don't take rest periods in your day, mm-hmm. then you're going to say, mm-hmm. okay, the only me time is this, like, after mm-hmm. I put the kids to bed, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And I just, like, want to veg out in front of mm-hmm. whatever. The term is quality. revenge bedtime procrastination. 
It's a real thing. Revenge bedtime procrastination. Mm -hmm. So you so, know, so. <laughs> right? Like yeah. we all we all wake up in the morning. You're like, okay, tonight I'm going to go to bed early because I'm yeah. so tired, yeah. right? This is your intention. And then the evening rolls around and you're spent from the day and you're like, I know I should go to bed, but I haven't had a minute to myself. So I'm just going to scroll or watch one more episode or do my online shopping or like one of those things. So I call those the mindless decompressing, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's mm -hmm. your... You're trying to decompress, but it's not really fulfilling. Mm -hmm. And it certainly mm -hmm. isn't intentional, mm -hmm. right? Yep. But it's almost all we know how to do. Yeah. Or it's our yep. default. Yeah. And one of the questions I always get asked is like, well, what do you do for your bedtime routine? And I'm like, it's not fancy. I just end my day and I put it away and I'm not relying on something else to decompress me. I'm using that time after my kids are in bed to typically like just sit on the couch and talk with my husband. We get a chance mm -hmm. to connect about our days and talk about our life plans, or we'll sit in the hot tub and do that or mm -hmm. read a book or have a cup of tea, like or do yoga. Mm -hmm. Those are the intentional ways that we can decompress. And exactly what you said is it helps your cortisol come down. Mm -hmm and lower. And what did I say before that? But sleep is that ultimate gauge of your nervous system. Right. But we can't flippantly say, well, just manage your stress because that's not yeah. effective. What does that either. mean? Yeah. What does that mean? Yeah. Yeah. Um, one of the things I always like to tell my clients, you know, that has worked for me is getting a book that doesn't make you think a lot, right? Mm -hmm. Like not, not something around, your business or even self-improvement necessarily just something for me. I like bios and I mm -hmm. like the like comedian mm. you know, <laughs> books written by comedians because then it's that um, sort of simplistic. My brain doesn't have to work so right. much, you know, yeah. and that's a winding down Yeah, um, because so many of us do, you know, and I've been guilty of this too after my surgeries and um, I couldn't sleep at all. And so I had the computer like in my bed, with, mm -hmm. you know, Netflix or what have you on. Mm -hmm. And you're like, okay, this is something that feels like it's helpful, but in mm -hmm. reality, mm -hmm. it's keeping you, you know, awake. Mm -hmm. So you, mm -hmm. even if you do fall asleep, it's not deep sleep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, uh, let's talk a little bit more about cortisol. We have covered mm -hmm. cortisol a lot on um, sure. podcasts, but I do want people to sort of understand this sort of first not line of defense exactly, mm -hmm. but what you have to kind of tackle when mm -hmm. it comes to sleep. And, mm -hmm. and can you kind of talk about how, you know, cortisol impacts us in the day and then also how that's ultimately connected to our sex hormones? Mm -hmm. I have one whole module in my program dedicated. I like to call it lowering and leveraging cortisol because cortisol isn't all bad, mm -hmm. right? right? Like we right. need to have it lower at the right time mm -hmm. of day or night, really. And we also want to leverage it for the benefits that it provides us. So if we look at the pattern over a course of 24 hours, like you said, our cortisol should start to rise really in the early hours of the morning. So for most people, that's going to start around 4 a.m. and it will reach a peak typically somewhere between and around 8 or 9 a.m. It's going to vary depending on your own circadian rhythm, but pretty well, most people are kind of reaching a peak point at, around that cortisol is helpful as it's rising to make us and help us get up and go to feel motivated, to feel like we have the energy to get out of bed and, and start our day. Mm -hmm. And then over the course of the morning, it should decrease and it should get to a lower point in the afternoon, not yet its lowest point, but that's where a lot of people experience that crash. And then from there, it should continue to decrease over the course of the evening to be at its supposed or ideal lowed, lowest point in the evening around 10 PM. Mm -hmm. That's going to be when most people are thinking about winding down and getting ready for bed. Mm -hmm. Right. And then from there, it will start to rise again, like you said, and, and really start to pick up in those earlier hours of the morning again. Mm -hmm. What I see in my practice is a lot of cortisol shifts happening. So mornings are chaotic. So people are, are jumping out of not literally, but you know, jumping yeah. out of bed or like hitting the ground running because they're, they're tired. So they're sleeping in and then they're getting out and they're rushing or they're starting work really soon to their wake up time. They don't have time to implement again, that intentional start to their day. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's reality, right? Sometimes you're like, I just need whatever sleep I'm, I can get because my kids kept me up all night or, or I'm sick or whatever. But when we're looking at this as, as what's optimal or what's ideal, then we can 
tap in and leverage that cortisol rise to help us feel awake and alert and ready to start our day. Mm -hmm. When we wake up, there's a hormone called adenosine that starts to build in our nervous system. And adenosine will build over the course of the day. The longer you're awake, the higher the amount of adenosine will be in, in your nervous system. That is the hormone that gives us what we call sleep pressure. That's the sensation that we all know, which is your head is heavy. Your eyes are heavy. Like you could just nod off. If you think about it being in a car ride or sometimes on the airplane or even mm-hmm. just watching TV in the evening. And, and you're like, I just want to sleep right now in this moment. So that is what will pick up and create that, that sensation over 14 to 16 hours after being awake. So let's say we've woken up at 6 AM, then it's going to peak somewhere between eight and 10 PM. Okay. Then ideally, right. We're asleep by again, by 10 PM and we have an eight hour sleep opportunity. Mm-hmm. If we stay awake longer than 16 hours, cortisol is released and, and your adrenal glands are engaged because your body has no idea why you are purposely staying awake longer than 16 hours <laughs> that the nuance or the notion of getting seven to nine hours a night is, is validated and recognized in the medical literature as what we need for adequate sleep as consolidated as possible. Meaning like not uh, ideally it's solid sleep, not broken, but if we're getting that seven to nine hours, less than that is significantly correlated with virtually every chronic health disease or complication that we could have. And so when we're awake longer, when we're choosing to procrastinate our bedtime and watch one more episode, that cortisol gets released and we feel awake again. Yeah. Because the only other time this happens in nature is when animals are foraging for food in times of famine. Mm. The animals don't procrastinate their bedtime. Yeah. They're like, I'm out. <laughs> I'm tired, right? They're in sync yeah. with the light rhythms and yep. the temperature rhythms and the seasonal rhythms and all of those components. So right. your body is always doing what it's supposed to do. Right. Right. Yeah. We aren't always yeah. <laughs> following through and supporting it. Yeah. The other thing I'll say about cortisol there as well is a lot of women that I see the pattern of like under fuel throughout the day and they're busy and go, 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 or skip the lunch break. Right. And they're doing all the things for everyone else. So they actually don't get an opportunity to properly eat or their largest caloric intake is in the evening. And what they think is their second wind is actually their first wind Mm. because it's finally the time that they have energy from eating properly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So those are the kinds of things we need to audit or explore or be curious about to say, okay, how do I feel if I front load my day with calories and get adequate protein? Yeah. My energy is way more consistent. Okay. And then at the end of the day, right. I can build in that time. I'm not saying you you have to put your kids to bed and, and then go to bed yourself. Although I do that sometimes. (laughs) I fall asleep with my five-year-old wall. Like, I'm just like, I'm just giving in here. So I'm done. (laughs) And I think that's, it also goes back to like, what did you learn about sleep growing up? What did, what's that deeper layer? And if you're, we're told, you know, oh, you can sleep when you're dead or if you sleep and you're lazy or, you know, kind of a negative connotation with prioritizing sleep or going to bed early or that, you know, you're only ever valued or recognized for productivity. And when you're in action, then it's something that women have to choose whether or not they want to relearn that and and say like, that's actually not my belief. That was just something I was taught Mm -hmm. and I need to prioritize rest in my body. And it's okay if I escape the rest of the world Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. early in the evening and, and, and sleep. I get that. Yeah. And, you know, to your point that you made about sort of the, the biggest meal for so many people being at dinner time, you know, I have so many clients come to me and we talk about that aspect and they are like, but I'm just not hungry in the morning, you know? And part of it is because Mm -hmm. you sort of trained your body to not be hungry Mm -hmm. in the morning partly due to the fact that you're having a huge meal at night, you know? And so it can take, I just want to bring that up for people that it can take Mm -hmm. a little bit of time. It's understandable Mm -hmm. if you're not ready to do a major breakfast in the morning when you haven't done that, you know, but really focusing on, okay, how can I increase that protein in the morning, Mm -hmm. early in the morning within that first hour of waking Mm -hmm. up Mm -hmm. and then how that changes your day, just Mm -hmm. that simple thing, right? 
Yeah. I have so many patients who are always amazed. And and I think they, they doubt me at first. They're like, I can't, can't make that big of a difference. And they come back and they're like, I can't believe how little protein I was eating. Yep. Absolutely. And how, when I get adequate amounts, how, how much of a difference it makes yeah. in mood and energy and sleep and, and everything. So yeah. It, it, yeah, it's one of those things that we maybe undervalue, but it's a really important tool. Right. And a, and a um, free tool, you know, mm-hmm. I mean, I think mm-hmm. so often we look to all of these things that are going to help us that, you know, it's like, give me a supplement, give me this. And it's, mm-hmm. as you're kind of speaking, it's so much, it's lifestyle shifts mm-hmm. is what kind mm-hmm. of the first layer has to be. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and choosing or deciding what you want to choose mm. is a big part of it as well. So thinking about that way that your day is playing out for me, I'm naturally a morning person. I understand if you're not, but I also hear a lot of women in my practice say, yeah, I would love to get up earlier and have some time to myself. Or I would, Mm -hmm. I, if I was sleeping better, I would wake up and work out Mm -hmm. and and get my exercise in then, or I would wake up and, you know, meal prep for the day or whatnot. And Mm -hmm. so sometimes we just have to decide that that's what we're going to do. We don't wait for that goal to be realized, Mm -hmm. right. By like, Oh, by the, whenever I'm sleeping better, it's like, no, you'll actually start sleeping better when you make the decision to get up earlier Mm -hmm. and have that time for yourself and prioritize the way that you're putting your day together because your day runs smoother, your nervous system, your blood sugar, all of those things are better regulated and supported. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of the day, for me personally, and, and I will say that many women express this too, is that time in the morning is so different than the time at the end of the day, because Mm -hmm. the time at the end of the day, you're spent. Right. 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 The time at the beginning of the day, when your sleep does improve, you wake up and, and there's a different energy Mm -hmm. to starting your day with intention and, and, and solid solitude, if that's available to you or some, even just sitting on the couch and enjoying your coffee. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And having a, having a minute, the energy that you feel at that time is so different than that depleted energy that you feel at the end of the day. So I've thought about that a lot. Like, why don't I feel the need to stay up later and, 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 and give in. And it's like, I've just made the decision that those, that morning time is more important to me. It's more valuable. It's Mm. ultimately more productive. It doesn't mean I'm always doing things. Right. 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 And it's more enjoyable. And at the end of the day, I would rather get an extra hour of sleep because it influences my mood and my ability to be present and my ability to work out or be good at my job or whatever it is, rather than that show or that extra scrolling that's so fleeting. And at the end of it, you're like, what did I just do for the past? Yeah. 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 Right. It's just, it's time suckage. Yeah. Yeah. Not saying you never, you can't ever do it or never do it, but it's, it's when it's on a regular basis. So often it's a symptom of something else. Like we're looking for connection or community or socialization or belonging or whatnot. And that's the only way we know how to access it. Absolutely. So what happens, let's kind of talk about the next layer when, you know, people do, women do get maybe a bedtime ritual in place, you know, they're like, I'm going to bed at a decent time. I'm falling asleep, but I'm still struggling Mm -hmm. with waking up at that 4 a.m. time. Mm -hmm. What, what Mm -hmm. three top reasons women typically struggle with waking up in the night. One are those hormone changes that shift. So again, there may be no changes to your menstrual cycle or there may be, Mm -hmm. but you don't have to wait. That doesn't have to be the permission slip or the sign that you're waiting for of like, oh, now that my cycle is irregular or has stopped and my sleep is affected, that must be it. It's Mm -hmm. that middle of the night waking can be the first sign, Mm -hmm. even if your cycle is still regular. Part of it has to do with temperature changes as well. You might wake up in a hot flash or night mm-hmm. sweat that might only be occurring in that late luteal phase. So as you get closer to your period, mm-hmm. maybe you haven't tracked that or noticed it, but I encourage women to do that. Mm-hmm. And it might just be that you feel warmer mm-hmm. it, uh, mm-hmm. to have what we call vasomotor symptoms. It doesn't have to be this dramatic, like actual sweating, need to change your pajamas or whatnot. 
just an increased sensation of warmth and needing to toss off the covers Mm -hmm. is, is enough to qualify. And so that's one of the ways that it influences those changes in hormones. Like you mentioned also impact mood. So we see an increase in anxiety and depression in midlife. And we also just see that it changes sleep period. Estrogen and progesterone both impact sleep and sleep structure and architecture and our ability to get deep sleep. And so when those hormones are, and, and this is where the, it's the withdrawal, right? So when you look at, okay, why is it that women are almost twice as likely compared to men or people with ovaries are, are, are twice as likely to experience insomnia or sleep disturbances. And it's not because they were ever exposed to estrogen, right? Because you have w- people and, and women of reproductive age who, who have estrogen and they don't get hot flashes. It's the withdrawal, right. Right. Or sleep disturbance. So it's the, it's like you have it and now you don't, or they're changing. So those hormone levels are changing so rapidly Mm -hmm. and sometimes it's obvious and sometimes it's, it's not. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times women go to their doctors and they're told like, Oh, it's not your hormones. Right. Right. And then their thought, their thought process is like, Oh, okay. You know, who am I? I'm, you know, I don't, I, I didn't go to medical school medical school or whatnot, even though they have this inkling of like, but I'm not depressed. Right. Right. Yep. Um, the second reason I often see is, is blood sugar fluctuations. So we're fasting when we're sleeping, we know that, but we sometimes don't think about it. Mm-hmm. And if your blood sugar drops below a critical threshold, cortisol is released to bring it back up. And for a lot of people, that's enough of a trigger to wake them up, even though they don't wake up in a panic, mm-hmm. it's, it's, you just wake up mm-hmm. and you're like, Oh, okay. I'm awake now. Yep. Do I need to use the bathroom or, right. or whatnot? And if that, if cortisol is behind that, often what happens is your mind starts running and racing and ruminating. Mm -hmm. And that's because cortisol's other job is to encourage you to scan your environment for potential threats. Mm -hmm. There's no lion, tiger, or bear in your bedroom. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping, (laughs) but that's why when we're like, Oh, I'm thinking about all the things and I'm awake. (laughs) Yes. All the things I didn't do, all the things I have to do that time when I was 16, like, right. right? right. Like all of those things that you're like, why am I thinking about this right now? Or and it, why does it feel like such a big deal? And yeah. and that's the impact and influence of cortisol. You're just yeah. made to, it makes things seem bigger mm-hmm. so that you are mobilized, right? Mm-hmm. Like you will respond. Mm-hmm. And the third reason is still those changes that happen to our circadian rhythm. So our, our internal body clock, everybody has one. There are different chronotypes, meaning there are different you know, the early bird or the night out, those are, mm-hmm. are very real. They're partly genetic and then partly learned. Mm-hmm. The good news is you can shift your body clock the same that's way. I'm sure many people have experienced jet lag. That's kind of an idea behind or an experience with how your body clock being on one time zone. And, and then when you travel faster than it can catch up for a few days, obviously you feel the impacts of that. And so as we get older, our sleep drive decreases. Mm. So we don't get the same, it, it, it's not as easy, which yeah. is what you said at the beginning too. It's like, oh, sleep is not a problem typically in like teenage yeah. years or twenties or whatnot, but it's like, it's not. And that again, isn't being flippant to be like, oh, you're just getting older. No, it's right. a very real physiological effect that your sleep drive and melatonin production and and the, the, what we call the amplitude. So like the amount that's produced and and the regulatory effects on it become more variable. Mm -hmm. And so if we are in tune and aware of all of the things that we do to influence both our hormones and our nervous system and our blood sugar, right. If we have that mindset component dialed in as well Mm -hmm. and understand then how our environment and light cues and all of those components are impacting our ability to wake up feeling rested in the morning and go through our day feeling composed and calm and collected and centered. And then being able to unwind and decompress effectively at night to invite a good sleep. Mm -hmm, Like mm -hmm. that's, that's what we need. So it doesn't mean it has to be complicated either. I don't want it to sound like so much. It's another thing you have to do. Yeah. I think it's actually about doing a lot less. <laughs> right, right, right. But, but we have to learn. Think, yeah, it's, yeah, it's that time that it takes to kind of shift that perspective. Mm-hmm. Um, so I know that there's lots of different ideas around this, but is there, you know, people always say, okay, what is a supplement that can be mm-hmm. helpful 
initially if you're having sleep issues? Yeah, I get asked about melatonin the most. Yeah, <laughs> sure. uh, melatonin <laughs> in the research, it, it really is most effective for shift work and jet lag. It's also effective for what we call delayed phase sleep wake disorder. That's Mm. the medical terminology for somebody who is a night owl (laughs) and is struggling, right? Yeah, (laughs) you got to have a term. So it's when you are truly struggle with navigating and managing your daytime responsibilities Mm -hmm. because you stay up too late and your desire is to shift your body clock so it's easier for you to fall asleep earlier so that you can get adequate sleep to get up on time for work or family Mm -hmm. or whatnot. So that's where we see melatonin is most effective. And really what it does is it helps us fall asleep faster. Mm -hmm. Right. It it doesn't help with what we call total sleep time. So (laughs) yeah, there (laughs) people still wake up at that four o'clock hour. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And there's one study and it was like melatonin significantly increases total sleep time. And I was like, oh, okay, let's look at this. And when you dive into it, it's like it increased it by eight minutes. I love it. Like, this is why we have to never rely on headlines around yes, stuff, right? Because yes, they do not tell the exactly. picture. Yeah. And I was like, I'm pretty sure if I told my patients they could get eight minutes of more sleep and that was, <laughs> you know, the best I could do, I don't think they would keep me around very long. <laughs> yeah. So that's that's the number one thing. More is not better. We right. typically don't see any added benefit other than potential adverse effects from more than five milligrams. And Mm -hmm. people often will say like, oh, more must be better. Mm -hmm. So they walk themselves with mega doses. And so the the most effective doses are typically between two and five milligrams. Mm -hmm. And so there is some research and it's more so out of Europe on using the prolonged release form. And interestingly, melatonin is is a prescription in most countries in Europe, Europe. Mm -hmm. which is also, I think, important to note because- a lot of melatonin. Yeah. It's a hormone. And a lot of melatonin supplements contain varying amounts of melatonin compared to what's stated on the label. And so if you are supplementing, you want to make sure it's third party tested and a professional grade supplement and, or it makes sense Mm -hmm. to why maybe we see that consistency in the research when it's looking at the prescription form, Mm -hmm. right? It's a prolonged release prescription form of melatonin that's been shown to help support insomnia and what they call older adults, which is 55 and older. Gotcha. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't make that didn't definition. Hear you, like I didn't say yeah. that. <laughs> um, otherwise there's certainly lots of supplements that can influence our sleep. When we look at things like GABA or L-theanine, magnesium, mm-hmm. uh, herbs like valerian or ashwagandha or whatnot. Um, a lot of the ones that are also, or would cross over into treating anxiety. So typically again, L-theanine or GABA or, or um, magnesium they tend to help th- with sleep by doing that, by decreasing mm-hmm. anxiety, mm-hmm. either in general or anxiety about sleep. And we don't necessarily see if we put people in a lab or have them track their sleep, that there's a big improvements in ability to stay asleep or the total amount of sleep that they're getting. Often there's a decrease in the, the time taken to fall asleep and an improvement in subjective sleep quality. I mean, people will say, I feel like I'm sleeping better, which is a really important measurement, Absolutely, right? It's It's a really important measurement. Um, of the herbs, ashwagandha, it doesn't, there's no, there's, I wish there was more robust and, and just larger volumes of research on, on sleep sup on supplements in general. And of course, as it relates to sleep, Mm -hmm. but of the herbs, ashwagandha has the better profile for helping regulate cortisol and improve total sleep time and ability to fall asleep, subjective sleep quality. And that's typically seen over eight weeks of use. Mm -hmm. So uh, the other thing we all do, right. Is like take something for one night. We're like, that didn't work. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 So we need to be taking it for the right amount for the right time time. and to be understanding what are we looking for? right? Like if you're somebody who typically does have trouble falling asleep, then maybe melatonin makes sense. Mm -hmm. If you're somebody who is struggling with those middle of the night wakeups, then what I use a lot in my practice, because I'm working with perimenopausal and menopausal women is, is progesterone. Progesterone, And the oral form of progesterone Mm -hmm. is what's been shown to be effective for managing vasomotor symptoms. So hot flashes, night sweats, and improving sleep Mm -hmm. and, and also helping with mood as well. So Can I ask you, and I know Mm -hmm. we have to wrap up here, but um, how do you utilize blood testing mostly for hormones or do you utilize dried urine or urine or saliva? Blood. Blood. Okay. Mm -hmm. So 
what do you kind of have an edge of what you would consider progesterone getting to be too low? Mm -hmm. Um, and that's, or is it more symptomatic that you say, okay. So yeah. So it always is where we're, where are we at? Like, what are we looking at in our, in, in, for my patients? And so with respect to progesterone, if a woman comes in and she's perimenopausal and she, let's say she's, you know, in her forties and is struggling with sleep and also started to notice maybe some slight cycle changes or worsening of PMS or whatnot. The reality is that ovulation frequency and predictability goes way down as we transition through perimenopause. Mm -hmm. And we only make progesterone once we ovulate right. and we can use things like hormones and progesterone to correct a deficiency. Mm -hmm. So we test it, it's low, we give it to you, or we can use it for their therapeutic benefit. Mm -hmm. So most of the times I'm using it for therapeutic benefit because we can test, we might nail the timing and yeah. see that she's ovulated in the previous seven to 10 days. We might no. try to test and it's an anovulatory cycle. So there's nothing there. And so right. it doesn't matter where those levels land. We can still use progesterone gotcha. for the benefit on sleep mm -hmm. in that population. And then of mm -hmm. course, if we're using it with estrogen and women who are menopausal, who still have a uterus, we need to use it for endometrial protection. So mm -hmm. we can then once a woman is established on an HRT regime and no longer menstruating or producing her own hormones, I'll test blood levels of hormones mm -hmm. to make sure we're getting in the target range and their symptoms are being managed and improving. It's both mm -hmm. because we can, I've had like normal, you know, quote unquote, normal lab levels, but the patient's like, I'm still having hot flashes. Or right. I'm still struggling with sleep. Yes. Like, okay. Let's 100%. push the dose up. Yeah. Or, um, the opposite where it's like, oh, your estrogen is like barely like hitting the mark. And yeah. they're like, I feel fantastic. Yeah. And so you're like, okay, great. And right. I appreciate you being a doctor that actually takes that approach because I think there's a lot of doctors out there that just focus on labs, right? Yes. And it's, you have to combine the symptoms in the labs, you know, mm -hmm. and really the symptoms are going to tell you so much in this process with the yeah. HRT and yeah, you know, yeah absolutely. absolutely. So, well, thank you so much for this You're illuminating so conversation on sleep and hormones. Let everybody know how they can get in touch mm -hmm. with you. Mm -hmm. So there's a five-step framework I've put together for women who want better sleep and balanced hormones. You can check that out at bettersleepbootcamp.com. And we're going to give your listeners and audience and community members $50 off, which is 10% nice. with coupon code hormonally speaking. Perfect. And we're going to set that up just like we said. And otherwise you can hang out with me. I'm at Dr. Leah Saunders ND on Instagram. That's probably the best place to hang out and get my sleep tips and see what I'm up to and join in on the different programs and offers I have in place as they roll out. Sweet. Perfect. Thank you so much for the work that you do. It really is such an important area to focus on. Um, and so I'm glad that you were able to come on the podcast and yeah. share all this good stuff with people. My pleasure. So, all right. Okay, you guys, I will see you next time.